It's certainly good to be back again tonight out here at this uh, Chautauqua and to um, be back with the victory in my heart of the Lord Jesus. Just a little tired. I haven't slept since night before last. I went home, picked up my family. My old Ford backslid, or it never backslid, it just wore out. And, and so I <clears throat> had to take it in the garage down there and then get up here and it's in the garage now. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's just about gone. So we are very glad to be here. And now we got two more great nights, Friday and Saturday. And we're expecting our Lord to do great things. And these nights, and we just don't know what lays ahead yet tonight. I like that because you can be expecting just anything to happen. Amen. God. We don't know just what time that God might just come into us here and, and just give us another Pentecost. That's what we need. Amen. And I would be so happy to be right in it with you to enjoy the fellowship, freshness of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, our lands really need it. We just had a case down home. Just, I looked in the paper this morning of a woman that shot a man to death right in the back and was freed in the courts. <laughs> Said she went blind when she was shooting. <laughs> The opposite attorney said, you sure are a good shot when you're blind. <laughs> but it just goes to show what money can do to pull a case over. Murder seems to be a very light thing. And crime is on the increase. Of course, you all are seeing the papers of these rock and rollers and what happened. And down here in this park and what happened and... Wasn't enough evidence there because some judges and mayor's daughters was in that, so they didn't have enough evidence of a hundred people to press charges. Brother, all things are wrong except God. There's only one thing that's left is right, and that's God. Only one justice, and that's God. But there is coming a day that when the righteous judge will give righteous judgment and the world will be judged by him, Jesus Christ. We're so glad to know that, that no matter what takes place here, there's coming a day. So we're looking forward to that day and pressing on towards the mark of the high calling in Christ, expecting any time for him to come. You know, I don't see many things left, but what will, would hinder him from coming to fulfill all the prophecies concerning his return? Brother Sullivan, could you say amen to that? Amen. Yes, sir. I believe that. I am too, brother, that just any time he could return. You know, I think that our meetings are most surely too short. When the people are gathered together, would it not be nice now if we, did, if we had about three or four weeks of this Amen. where we could have afternoon instruction services and preach on the second coming and lay the scriptures out and talk of them and have a ministerial meeting every morning at 10 o'clock where ministers to get together and fellowship? Oh, if God willing, I can just steal it in the wind, I'm going to have me a big tent one of these days, so we can pitch it somewhere and stay for four to six weeks instead of staying. And then, we believe then, if something after the people's prayed for, many times people doesn't understand how to take a hold of healing. And little short meetings like this, you can't instruct them. You've got sinners there, so you have to preach the word. You've got to make altar calls. You have to think about the anointing of the Holy Spirit under discernment and all these things and just a night or two to do it in. And then, like a person being healed, if they're not 
See, faith don't know any defeat. A young woman come to me some years ago. It's when ladies begin to wear those, what they call scandal skirts in our country. It's kind of spit up on the side. And she was a Christian girl of a certain denomination of church. And she said, Brother Branham said, do you think it's wrong for we Christians to wear these kind of skirts? And I said, what kind's that? And she said, it's a scandal skirt. I said, in the first place, I don't see what a Christian want to wear anything with scandal. But I said, if it, why are you asking me? There's a question in your mind. And as long as there is a question in your mind, don't do it. That's the best way to stay away from it. Wrong. If there's one question in your mind, stay away from it. But then when it is perfectly clear to you, then go ahead. Then you can do it with faith. That's the way I try to do my meetings with 400 and something major cities here in America calling besides the world. I lay them out and pray until I'm sure in my heart that God is calling me to a certain place. Then I go. No matter how bad it turns out, whatever it is, I always find out it's God working, maybe with one person. It's best to always obey God and don't have no questions. Now, if there's a question in your mind about receiving the Holy Ghost, whether it is for today or not, you'll never receive it like that. You can't do it. You've got to know that the promise is to you and you are... And then if there's anything in your life that condemns you, you just might as well make that right first because he will not come in over the top of that. Okay? You've got to make it right. Then when we have everything clear and understand perfectly, then we can go to walking. Jesus said in St. Mark eleven twenty four, If you say to this mountain, be moved, and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass. You can have what you said. Not what I said, what you said. See, if you don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass, you can have what you have said. But now before you can have that, and the way I always try to think of that, there has to be the right kind of a motive and the right objective. And if your motive is right, your objective is right, and your faith is right, because if you feel that it's the will of God, nothing can keep it from happening. Just think of that. I don't care what it is. If you say to the mountain, be moved, and maybe if you've got to go over the mountain for a purpose, not to say, Somebody will say, oh, I'm a great man of faith. I move that mountain. It'll never move. But if there's something over the mountain that you've got to get over there for to do the will of God, you can't get over it, under it, or around it, and yet something in your heart is telling you to go, you speak the word. Don't you doubt. And maybe when you speak the word, only one little grain of sand will fall. But it's on its road. The next day a spoonful may drop. The next day a teacup full. You'll never notice it. But if you'll just hold steady knowing that it's being done, after a while the whole thing will fall in. That's the way it is by divine healing. When you see the working of the Holy Spirit, the Word laid on, and the Holy Spirit anointing that word and proving it that he is here in our midst to vindicate himself and to give to you the promise. Then you accept your healing. If there's sin in your life, get it out. If there's condemnation, get it out. If there's doubt, get it out. Until you can see perfectly that it's God's will, it's God's plan, and you're included in that, then say, sickness, in the name of Jesus Christ, get away from me. And remember, you might not feel any better 
for a week. But as soon as you said that word, something happened. God has to keep his word. That sickness shakes and he begins to turn loose. He'll go if you'll just believe it. Don't doubt. Like Peter walking on the water, he said, Why did you doubt? Oh, ye of little faith. Just because he was sinking, that had nothing to do with it. Christ had commanded him, and his word was enough. That's the way we should think it too. Well, that's all for my text for tonight. But that is true. Now, we are going to try to get into the prayer cards if there's any of them left tonight. Just whatever the Holy Spirit will. And then tomorrow night we'll try to give out some more prayer cards. I think we've got a bunch left over from the first or second night. Because the Holy Spirit has been doing such a marvelous thing among us. Oh, how we ought to appreciate that. And I'm sure that you do. There would not be one uh, room for any doubt. I wish to say this just in a way of testimony. There's so many things that I could say. As I drove up just a few minutes ago, there was a, a young woman come to meet me. And she said, Brother Branham, I don't want to interrupt you, but she said, I just couldn't keep from telling you this. I said, all right, sister. And she was holding the prettiest little chumpy baby in her arms. And she said, when you were here the last time, I was in the prayer line. And when I got close to you, you said, what you are here for, sister, is not for any ill thing, but you are losing your children with miscarriages. And you're wanting me to ask God to let you have a baby. And I said, that's an honorable thing. And she said, that is right, sir. And said then something as it always does, thus saith the Lord. Go home for you shall have your baby. And tonight she showed me a little plumpy sweet baby that God gave her in his amazing grace. The lady here somewhere, I believe her name is Mrs. York, she told me. Are you here close, Mrs. York? Uh, here she stands right here now with a baby in her arms. Oh, the same God of the Old Testament. is the same God today. He never fails. So, I have a woman that I know of now that seeing some of my Canadian friends sitting here from Canada. About 14 years ago, this woman being around 48 years old, came into the meeting a German-Canadian. And she said, the Lord told her in the prayer line through the discernment that she was barren. And the doctors had said that she would never be able to have a child. And said, you're also suffering with the dreadful disease of tuberculosis. And she said, that is true, sir. I said, go to your home, for you are healed of your TB, and you're going to embrace a lovely little eight-pound boy baby, thus saith the Lord. She went home and was solid and well. The doctors said her case was retarded, so it was no more fooling with it. After about eight years passed, you can see the woman's age now. She said she got into a church that told her, said, 
Sister, if that would have been of God, it would have happened. And she believed it. And as soon as she made her stand against it, she broke again with TV. And then the preacher, not aiming to, I don't believe, he said, I was a psychiatrist. I was a mind reader. And I was just reading what was on her mind. And her loyal husband stood up and said, but he told her, thus saith the Lord. And the preacher laughed at him. And his wife took the bed with TB. I was in the northern British Columbia on a hunting trip. Coming down to Edmonton, I stopped and for about two hours. And there's about seven or 8,000 people had gathered. And after the service, I didn't have my, no, my little dress coat. And the, a man come up and he said, Brother Branham, I'll give you my overcoat. I was hot and sweating. And I said, no. Th-. I said, aren't you Brother Doble? He said, I am. Oh, I said, the welfare of your wife. And he said, Brother Branham, told me the story. Said she's real bad with TB. I said, why did she doubt it? He said, well, Brother Branham, it lingered so long. She began to doubt. I said, I don't care how much she doubts. I saw that vision. She was holding a great, big, plumpy baby boy. And it shall come to pass regardless of what she says or what she thinks. Because God's already said so. A vision cannot be hindered. Fred Sothman, a good friend of mine, is sitting present now. About two years ago, I guess it has been Brother Fred or three, we was up in Saskatchewan, Prince Albert, I believe it was. Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and in the arena. And a telegram came in. Mrs. Doble was on her road up there within the space of three days of having her baby. And they brought her in a special car because her that age is afraid she could not go through it. I prayed for her and she said, One thing, Brother Branham, I confess my sin of unbelief. But said, One thing I want to ask you for a confirmation. You said it would be a boy. I said, It will be a boy. And just as soon as they could return her home, she had an eight-pound baby boy that's running around in Canada tonight of a mother over 50 years old because God keeps His Word. He never fails. Let us pray. Lord, while we're in the, this that we call time, it runs out so quick. But one day we'll step out of time into eternity and we'll sit down by the river beneath the evergreen tree and there we'll meet our friends and testify and praise His name forever. I'm expecting to see millions of them there that we have preached to and ministered to. But while we are here, Lord, in the heat of the day, we pray tonight that you'll give us thy grace and thy mercy. And may every sick person that you're sick of sin or sick of their body, may this be a thus saith the Lord for them tonight. May we meet them later as we did this lovely woman tonight, Mrs. York. And another time, maybe in a great tent somewhere. And hear them testify that it was at the Chautauqua that your mercy came down and healed them. 
saving them and filling them with the Holy Spirit. Grant it, Lord. Bless the few words that shall be read from your word. We wish to read them because our words will fail, but your word is eternal, and it cannot fail. Bless the efforts that we put forth, healing the sick and saving the lost, bringing the backsliders back home. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. This faithful pastor has got a little note wrote here, the altar's on your right. <laughs> that shows a real faithful pastor wants to see the lost saved. That's what we're here for, to see the lost saved and to bless the people. And you're always a blessing to me. In the book of Jeremiah, the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse, I read. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is the sickness of the daughter of my people not recovered? I want to take a text, if we would call it, on this subject. Why? God, when He makes a way of escape or sends a shower of mercy and the people ignore it, God asks why. He's got a right to ask why. When He makes everything ready and presents it, and then the people turn it down. God wants to know why did they do it. And he has a right to ask why. For he did it for our good. Like in the first chapter of Second Kings, after the death of Ahab, that wicked king of Israel, Ahazah reigned in his stead, which was his son. And he was just as wicked as his father and mother, Ahab and Jezebel. And while he was walking up in the top of his palace in Israel, while he was king over them, he fell through. And when he did, a great sickness set in upon him. And he was almost dead. And he called two of his soldiers and sent them over to Akron to inquire of the god Beelzebub if he was going to get over that sickness or not. He did it secretly. And when they were on their road going, doing this wicked thing, there is no wickedness but what God knows about it. There was a little old bald-headed prophet sitting down in a little mud hut somewhere in the desert, and the angel of the Lord come to him and told him what was going on. And he said, go up there and stand in the road. And he cut across the desert and up over the hill. And he stopped the two soldiers. And he said, go back and tell that king. Is there no God in Israel? Is there no prophet in Israel? That you might consult these things that you'd have to send up to Akron? To the God Beelzebub? Is that the reason there's no prophet here or no God to consult? You have to go to such resources as that. Said, so go tell him, thus saith the Lord. 
that he'll not come off of that bed, but he's going to die for his wickedness. The soldiers turned and went back. And when they got back to this king, he said, why did you return? He said, we met a man. And he told us thus. The king said, what kind of a looking fellow was he? said, he was hairy all over and he wore leather on his loins. And the king said, that's Elijah the Tishbite. He knew he had done wrong. There was a God in Israel. There was a prophet in Israel. But it was because of the king's stubbornness. It was because of his wickedness and his willful sin that he didn't come and consult God about it. And he lost his life. So is it today. We don't need so many UNs. If we are a Christian nation, let's call God on the scene. The reason there is no bomb in Gilead, sure there is bomb. There is a God in America. There is a God here. It's because of the stubbornness of the people that they don't want to consult Him. They'd rather take the advice of some intellectual student than to come to the blessed Holy Spirit that God sent to the earth. It's the reason that we are in such a condition today. It's not because there isn't a God. It's not because the Holy Spirit isn't still real. It's because the stubbornness of the people. It's because they want to sin. It's because they desire to do those things. That's what's in their heart. It's like a man dying on a doctor's steps. If a doctor has a remedy for the disease that the man has, and the man sits on his steps but refuses to take the remedy, he'll die there. And it isn't the doctor's fault. He's got the remedy. And he's willing to give it. But the man's too stubborn to take it. And so is it today. There's no need of any man dying in sin. There's no need of all of this stuff that's going on. God's got the remedy. And the people sit on the church steps and die because they won't receive it. They die in sin sitting in the church in the pew because they won't receive it. There's a bomb in Gilead. There's a physician there. But the people won't take his medicine. The local church member, lukewarm, thinks he's too good to take the medicine of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God's medicine. It's a cure. But the local church member won't do it. They'll go to church. They'll put their name on books. They're willing to pay their tithings. They're willing to do anything like that. But when it comes to taking the medicine, they won't do it. Now, how do we get medicine? The first thing, science begins to search out until they find a certain toxin. And then they inject that into a guinea pig. And they see how the guinea pig reacts with it. And if the guinea pig recovers and it works out perfectly, then they'll give it to the human being. Now, not all human beings are made like guinea pigs. You can give some medicine to a man and it'll help one and kill the other. So you might have an excuse for that because 
medicine will help one and kill the other. So you might have to wonder about that, but you don't have to wonder about God's bomb, God's toxin, the Holy Ghost. It'll cure every time it's applied. It's been tested and tried, and it's perfect. The guinea pig cure is all right. The sin of the world today, the greatest disease is not the heart disease. It's the sin disease that's killing the world. That's what's breaking up the nation today, breaking up the whole world is sin. And there's plenty of cure for it, but the people won't take it. They don't want nothing to do with it. Just like the man sitting on the doctor's steps. Here comes a man out that had the same disease and he's well. Another one comes out and says, that's fanaticism. I ain't going in there. He'll die there because he rejects to take the medicine. And so is it. A man will die and sink into death dark eternity without knowing God if he refuses the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God's toxin. It's for him. Some people say, I just can't keep from sinning. Brother Branham, I got a cigarette habit. I just can't quit it. I got a drinking habit. I can't quit it. I got a temper. I just can't get rid of it. You're only stalling. You're just refusing to use God's toxin. It'll cure it if you'll just take it. And sometimes it's hard. But it always does you good. It takes bad tasting medicine sometimes to do you any good. My old mother, no Kentucky mama, we lived down there in the hills where we eat black-eyed peas and cornbread, rendered meat skins to get the grease to put in the, the cornbread. And every Saturday night, Mom would give us a bath in a big old cedar tub. How many of you Kentuckians ever seen an old cedar tub? Sure. And I want to tell you, there was no change in the water. Just add a little bit more warmer water to it. From the first to the last of nine boys... And then the next thing was to take place on Saturday night to keep from taking plaguery, the food we had to eat, she'd make us take castor oil. I can't stand the smell of the stuff yet. And I'd come hold it by those. And I'd say, oh, mama, it makes me so sick. She said, if it doesn't make you sick, it don't do you any good. So that's the way it is with the gospel. It's got to make you sick first at your sins so it can do you some good. Hold your nose and take it. You may have to act like a, I don't know what, but it's good anyhow. It'll cure sin every time. Yes, the reason people don't want to take it is because of their style and their pride. I see it's getting to creep into us Pentecostal people. A little pride. We don't want to do it. I don't want to get down there that altar and boo-hoo. Now let me tell you something. I've got a mixed audience here, but I want you to understand this in the light that it's given. Any birth is a mess. I don't care where it's at. If it's in the pig pen in the barn... If it's in a house or a pink decorated hospital room, a birth is a mess. And so is a new birth a mess. You can't come up, starch, and say, I receive Christ as my personal Savior. Nonsense. Get down there at the altar and stay there until you are born again. It's a mess, but it brings life. I don't care what scale or what level I have to come on to. My Baptist brethren told me, he said, Billy, you're going to be a holy roller. 
I didn't care if it was holy roller or holy jumper, whatever level it was. I wanted new life. I didn't care what it was, what level it was. When you're ready to receive it, you'll come and get it. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. The old darky down in the south was so happy with the Holy Ghost and his boss said, I'd like to have some of that there heartfelt religion. I said, well, boss, you can have it. I said, well, now wait. I said, I'll get ready for it and I'll tell you. I said, all right, I'll be waiting for you. So one day, it was a rainy day. Oh, the rain was just a pouring. And the boss said, Mose, I'm ready to get that Holy Ghost you're talking about. I said, all right, boss, I'll be glad to go with you. So he said, let's go over to the corn crib. The corn's all out of it now, and it's just been swept out. It's nice and dry and clean. And they walked over there, and Moe said, but boss, this is not where you get it. He said, all right, we'll go up in the hayloft. He said, it's nice and soft and the smell of hay. He said, we'll go up in the hayloft. And when they climbed up there, Moe looked around. He said, but this is not where you get it, boss. He said, then, Moe, where do you get it? He said, follow me, said Moe. And he began to roll up his britchy legs. And he walked out into the pig pen, plumb up to his knees. And he said, here's where you get it. Oh, he said, I, I don't want to come out there. said, I didn't think you was ready for it at the beginning. That's it when you really want God. I don't care how it comes. You are willing and ready. You will receive it. Anything's got to die before you can get life. And life only comes by death. Life is by death. You take a grain of corn and you plant it. Except that grain of corn will lay there and not only die, but rot. Then it will spring forth new life out of that rotten mess. And until man gets those, all the human-made psychology beat out of them by the Holy Spirit and lay there until they're rotten to their own ideas, then they will receive the Holy Ghost. When you can get all the creeds and stuff beat out of you, rotted out of you, till it's dead and rotten. That's awful bad, but that's the only way I know to say it. You understand it. Till it rots, then new life will come. But as long as there's any hopes for it not to rot, new life won't come. That's why we get up in the altar so many times without the Holy Spirit. Because we don't rot enough to our own ideas. We've got to meet God on His level. Amen. I like to meet Him there because that He never has failed me. The new birth is no different from any other birth. It's a mess. You ought to see what mess I was in when I got it. And every once in a while, when it comes up on me again, I get messy again with it. I cry and boo-hoo and carry on till I guess I don't look very good to look at, but it, I got something on the inside of me that's taking me on and on and on and on and on. It's new life. I don't care what it looks like. I want to know what it is. That's the main thing. Now... There was a time when there wasn't any toxin for smallpox. There was a time when the salt vaccine for the children in polio, they didn't have that. But they got it now. They've got it. There was a time when there wasn't a cure for sin. There was a time when the, under a law of death, God caused cattle to die and sheep to die. And under that an atonement was made for sin, but it only covered sin. It didn't do away with it. So a man had an excuse. He could go back and his heart wasn't changed. Each year he would come in and offer a lamb for cleansing. 
and for his sins. But now, there's no excuse. There is plenty of toxin in the house of God. And it's for sin cure. Be for sin a double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. There is toxin in the house of God. Now, when doctors investigate medicine for their patients, it's tried by a guinea pig. But when God wanted to give the test for the human race, He never inoculated a guinea pig, but He inoculated His Son, the Lord Jesus Tuck the toxin of God's Holy Spirit and His action on earth proved what it was. Amen. When they spit on Him, He prayed for their forgiveness. When He was riled upon, He riled not back. It showed that the toxin held. When they killed Him and He died on the cross bleeding and blading, He was praying for their forgiveness. The toxin kept good. Then finally a Roman spear embalmed his body by smashing into his heart. And blood and water poured out. They said, now it's gone. He's given up the spirit. The earth shook. He died until the sun would quit shining. He died died until the stars refused to shine. He died until the earth was so black you could feel it. He died and went to the lowest regions of hell bearing our sins. You could not go deeper in hell than he went. You could not suffer harder than he suffered. You could not die better than he died. But brother, on that first Easter morning, the toxin went to work. It broke the seals of death. It smashed the devil in the face. It rolled back the stone and the Son of God lived again. He's alive forevermore. The toxin worked. God put it on His own Son to prove it. That it would work. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's how God was in Christ. God come and took the toxin himself in a human body that he created himself, the Son of God. And he lived in that and he took the toxin. But on Easter morning it proved that it helped. Then he had some people that was ready for it. When they put the fingers, some of them so doubtful of the medicine, they were sitting on the steps until they touched his side. There was some more done, turned back to backside. On the road to Emmaus, but they seen him do something like he did before his crucifixion. They know the toxin was working. Oh, brother, you're going to call me a holy roller anyhow. It still works just as real as it was then. There is a bomb in Gilead. There's a toxin for sickness. There's a toxin for healing of the soul and body. It's in the house of God today where there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he washed all my sins away. Don't tell me, brother, I've been inoculated by him. It takes a desire of sin out of your heart and puts a hallelujah there that nothing can compare with it. When you're inoculated. Say, I don't think I could hold out. Get inoculated once. Now I'll prove to you what God's bomb in inoculation is. The first candidates was 120. They went up in the upper room for inoculation. He said, I have been with you, but now I'm going to be in you. They went up for the inoculation. 
And all of a sudden there came the serum from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and flaps of fire burning. And it inoculated 120. So much joy filled their souls till they spoke in other languages and ran out through the streets shouting and acting like a bunch of drunk men. They didn't care what it looked like. They didn't care what anyone said. They come to God's level to get it. If you ever get it, you'll come to the same place. That's the only place he gives it. It's on that level. It worked so well to a few days after that. There was a man that was about to condemn a people called the Gentiles. An inoculation went to work and he saw a vision. There was the same man started walking through the gate called Beautiful. And the inoculation started working when he seen a man lame from his mother's wombs. He didn't want to pronounce, if you'd only seen Jesus when he was here, he was inoculated too. Such as I have, I'll give it to you, he said. Well, I'm so glad there's plenty of serum. Yes, plenty of it. It worked so well till when one was a dying and they was building the executor's block to chop off his head. How's inoculation going to work, Paul? He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me it that day. Not only me, but everyone that will be inoculated. Then they said, the grave of Moses, said the devil. He said, grave, O death, where is thy stained grave? Where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who has inoculated us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he lives, I live also. Sure. You're going to be asked why you didn't get it. Plenty of serum. On the day of Pentecost, when they seen all this carrying on, there's some honest hearts there. And they want to be candidates. So they said, what can we do? Is there a physician here? God asked the question, is there no physician? Thank God we still got physicians. Is there no physician here? There was one stepped up by the name of Dr. Simon Peter. He said, I'm going to write you a prescription. And it'll last forever. For it is unto you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call from heaven. Dr. Simon Peter's prescription is just as good tonight. If you don't believe it, come to the office and fulfill it. Hallelujah. Oh, sure. The inoculation is good. It'll hold. It's good. It's good. Now, when we see him inoculating, seeing the signs that he did returning back, it shows they're inoculated with the same thing. Brother, if the Holy Spirit will work the same in the members of the church that Christ has saved, then they'll raise up from the dead just the same as he did. No wonder we can say, Death, where is your staying in grave? Where is your victory? If it healed the sick in that day, the same inoculation will do for you today. If it was a, an antidote to sin, an antidote to sickness, it's the same thing today. Then, brother, sister, upon those bases, let me ask you this final question. Is this, why is there so much confusion among us? Why is there so much sin in our midst? What's the matter? Is it because there is no Bomb in Gilead? Is it because there is no Holy Ghost? Why then is the church in this shape? Why then is it because there's no physician? Oh yes, there is. There is. But you'll die on his steps under his ministry, not knowing God or either being healed, unless you'll take the prescription that's being wrote out for you. I'm the Lord that heals all thy diseases. Can you believe it? May the Lord bless you as we think about it while you bow your heads. Oh, Lord, we are so glad that there is a bomb in Gilead. 
We are so happy that there is a physician there. Then at the day of the judgment, this self-righteous America, England, and other great nations who's heard the gospel is going to be asked, why didn't you receive it? When anointed physicians goes forth to handle the word and the results follow everyone that comes, then there is a bomb in Gilead. Here sits before us tonight alcoholics, wretched women, immoral man that once walked the street with lust. Today are sated. There are women who drank and stuck needles in their arms until the earthly physicians could do nothing for them. And today they're witnessing up and down the streets of the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. There's barren women packing babies in their arms because they were inoculated for the keeping of their children. There are those that were blind can now see. There are those that were lame can now walk. There are those that had cancer dying and now are alive because there is a bomb. No matter how much the unbeliever shakes his head and walks away, that doesn't take away the toxin. There's plenty of it tonight. In the arms of Christ, we pray, Lord, that you'll inoculate every person here tonight that has a desire to sin in their heart. Take it away from them, Lord. My grace is sufficient, said the Holy Spirit. Now we pray, Father, that you'll heal the sick, give mercy to them who are in need. For there is a bomb in Gilead, and there is a physician there. The great physician is there. The one who never lost a case, never lost a patient, and cannot lose nothing, but said, All the Father has given me, I'll lose nothing, and I'll raise it up at the last day. The great physician. He shows his presence with us night after night. And we pray, God, that he'll do the same tonight by saving the lost and healing the sick. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice when the cures all pass home at last ever to rejoice don't you want to see him let's sing it all oh, i want to see you look upon his face i worship him there to sing forever On the streets of glory, let me live my voice. My tears of past, all that last ever to enjoy. Doesn't that make you feel good? Oh, I love him. Don't you love him? Let's sing that good old song, I love him, I love him, because he first loved me. How many knows it? How many Christians here tonight? Raise your hand. Now put your hands down. How many would like to be Christians? Raise your hands. God bless you. God bless you. That's good. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Back over here. All right. Make that surrender to him right now, right where you're sitting. Make that surrender while we sing, I love him. I love him. I love him. Raise your hand now. He Trust that God just saved your soul, man.
was inoculated as her just my salvation on Calvary. Oh, don't you just love him? Don't you like to just worship him, feel that goodness of his mercy? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. The message is over. Just worship in your heart. Paul said, if I'll sing, I'll sing in the Spirit. i worship in the Spirit. He's here. I know he's here. Oh, I just love him. Just in your own way now, while the piano and organ and so forth is playing, just worship him. Close your eyes. I love him. Lord, we love him. I love him because he first loved me. And first just my salvation on Calvary. Now with our heads bowed, the sinner friend, if you don't know him yet and you know that he's present, would you like to walk up here? Let me shake your hand right here and pray with you just a moment. You're invited. While we're singing, if the Holy Spirit should speak to you, I want to go up. I won't be ashamed of him. I'm going to go up and stand tonight. I really mean it. I don't care what my neighbor thinks. No, you're coming to be born again. It'll be a mess. They'll laugh at you and talk about you. But are you willing to bear the reproach of Christ as Paul said to Agrippa in the way that's called heresy that's crazy that's the way I worship the God of our fathers would you join his rank tonight I love him because I'll be waiting me and just my salvation Breeze tree mm. God bless you my brother come right around be another who would say I want to accept him he's going right on around so he can finish the thing he had some habits I told him about it the spirit of God is here he's going right around now to make that right
and sisters, please go over there and pray with these seekers. Be willing to give something instead of getting something tonight. Some of you sisters that wants to see God move, go over there and pray with those seekers, won't you? That's a good way to show how religious you are. Go over there and pray with these that are trying to get to God. like to come Calvary's tree. Can we have some more Consecrated brethren that will go over here and pray. Consecrated brethren, you want to see somebody actually get to God, go ahead and pray, won't you? You'll have to be more interested in getting people to God than anything else to get anything from God. Go right on, Christian brethren. I appreciate that. God appreciates it. Are you sure you don't want to come? Those little children, young men, making confessions, standing here, tears running down their cheek out of rock and roll parties and things. That's what God wants to see. That's the purpose. The healing can wait just a minute. We want healing of the soul. If you get healed of your body, possible if you live long enough, you'll get sick again. But if you're ever healed of your soul, you'll never be sick again. the truth that you have to die before you live. All right. 
How many believes that that great Holy Spirit is here? What was that prayer card for you about first night? What? A's. We give our prayer card A's first. We want to get rid of them. How many has prayer card A? All right. Before anybody comes, how many doesn't have a prayer card at all? And you want God to heal you. Raise up your hand. Raise up your hand now so I can see who you are. All around, everywhere. Not a prayer card, but you want God to heal you. All right? Let's just be in prayer just a moment. You take your burden to the Lord. Now, if I call someone with a prayer card, you let me know it's a prayer card. I'll ask you for the Holy Spirit, because a lot of them people, prayer cards will, will come. Now, just be reverent. If God, without the prayer cards, will prove. How many has been in the meetings before? Let's see your hands. Pretty or all of you, I'm sure. Jesus looked upon the audience. He said to Peter, Your name is Simon and your father's name is Jonas. He said to Nathaniel, I saw you before you come here when you were under the fig tree. He told the woman at the well, Go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. He said, That's right, you got five. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know the Messiah will do that. He said, I'm the Messiah. I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city saying, come see a man who told me the things I've done. He perceived their thoughts, knowing what they were doing. That was a sign of the Messiah then. And if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's a sign of Messiah tonight. Is that right? This that you might know before I call the prayer cards, because I'm going to line them up here and pray for them here at the altar without discernment. I want you with, you with prayer cards, not discernment. You that hasn't got prayer cards, let's see what the Holy Spirit will say. Just pray. There was a woman one time touched his garment. He didn't see her do it, neither did he feel her do it with his physical body. But he turned and said, who touched me? Everybody just said nothing. They denied it. But he looked around until he found the little woman. And he said, thy faith has saved thee. Is that right? Told her she had a blood issue and her faith had saved her. And now the Bible said he's the high priest tonight that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Do you believe that? With all your heart? All right. See if you can touch him. I'll yield myself to the Holy Spirit and see if some of you little women, little men, or whoever you are out there can touch him. Somebody in this direction. Yield yourself. Believe him. Touch him by faith. See if he's the same Jesus. Way in... That's so far back, huh? Keeps holding there just a moment. Here it is again. This little woman sitting right here, suffering with trouble in her head. A little lady looking at me, kind of long hair, looked like hanging down her back. Shaking her head. You have head trouble, don't you, lady? Or you did have it. You don't have it now. It's gone. Are we strangers to one another? Have you got a prayer card? You don't. You don't have a prayer card. We don't know one another. If we don't know one another, shake your hand like this. We don't know one another. First time of meeting. Was that right, what was told you? All right. You have what you asked for. Go home and be well. What did she touch? I see a young man sitting right down below her there. Real thin. He's shattered to death. It's a young kid. He's got a dark shadow over him. It's leukemia. Do you believe, Sonny Boy, that God will heal you? Raise up in your seat. Stand up to your feet. I don't know you. you just sitting there praying. Is that right? Raise up your hand if that's true. You believe Jesus Christ makes you well? Go home. I condemn that cancer in the name of Jesus Christ. The shadows of death pass from you. Someone else. I see a little woman waving her white handkerchief down there. She's got a yellow dress on. She's crying. That light's hanging over. Have you got a prayer card, lady? You don't. Do you believe me to be God's prophet? Do you believe if I'll yield myself to the Holy Ghost? He can tell me what your trouble is. You got heart trouble and a nervous condition. If that's right, wave your handkerchief back and forth. 
You're healed. Go home. Jesus Christ makes you well. Somebody else in this direction hasn't got a prayer card. Raise up your hand so I can see who you are. Pray. Pray. Here's a lady sitting right here praying at this row here. There's a light hanging over. She's not, no, it's not nothing wrong with her. She's got her child. And the child, a little girl, has something wrong. It's one side of her face didn't grow right. If you'll believe with all your heart, the child's face will be normal. If you can believe it, go home and receive it. Be made well for the kingdom of God's sake. Back in here. Here's a lady sitting right down here. She's got a white dress on. She's praying. She's raising her hand. You believe that God will heal that heart trouble for you, lady? If you do, stand up on your feet. All right. I want to ask you something. While you were praying, Lord, let him call me. I don't know you. If that's right, wave your hand. All right. I don't know you. You were praying for me to call you. You touched the high priest. As soon as I spoke your name, something happened. A real warm feeling went over you. If that's right, wave your hand. Your heart trouble's gone. You can go home and be made well in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it now? Now, how many has prayer card A? Come line up right along the side of this place here. Prayer card A. A believer of the Lord Jesus. You believe if I'll pray for you, lay hands on you, you'll get well? We can't take this whole line in discernment, you know that, but we can pray for you. After all, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Is that right? Now, I want you to look at all those people out there. While these people are coming through the line, how many will pledge that they'll be praying for them? Raise up your hands out there. Now, new prayer cards will be given out at 6 o'clock tomorrow afternoon again. So we go to pray for everybody that's got a prayer card. Everybody that has a prayer card, we're going to pray for now, we don't necessarily have to have a prayer card. Now, this is for prayer card A. A. I think they got some more out. Billy said he'd give out some C's or B's or something. B. Well, now, hold them. They're next. See, this is for A. This is for A. We promised them a long time. Now, if you all will just be reverent and pray, these, this is the healing service. Now, I think I'll get right down here at the end of this row or somewhere in here. So the people right at the end of the row and pray. Now, everyone, keep your head bowed and pray. Everybody, if you're sincere and believe the Holy Spirit is here, of the anointing, I have the anointing upon me now. Now, I'm coming down to lay hands on you while the anointing is upon me. That's the reason I had this discernment first. That man with that kidney trouble sitting out there, go home, sir, you're healed. God makes you well. Forget about it now, sitting there in the dark. All right. Now, believe with all your heart. Come here now. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer all him the voice of Jesus. Sweet Know ye what I have done unto you? Now look, while we are praying, we don't like that. We don't take time for the discernment because, oh, there was a few in there that was real bad cases and one sinner. So it was, that had to be called out. But otherwise, it was while the anointing of the Holy Spirit was with me, I was laying hands on the sick. Now, with all my heart, I prayed for you. 
That's all I can do. I'm just a man. See? Now, but the Holy Spirit is here and will reward you if you will believe that the sickness and disease or affliction of your body is condemned. See? It's condemned. It, it can't stay with you no longer. Now, you watch. You, I prayed for a woman that her hands was knotted up. And she, she might have been looking for her hands to straighten. It could have been that we could have tucked that woman there for maybe a half hour, stayed with her until you've seen differences beginning to come. Then it would cut others out, see? Now, maybe one of the nights, we'll do that. I'll sh- will you see, until I can see in the audience something that's really fixing to happen, I will bring that patient maybe to the platform here. Crippled, afflicted, Heal just as same. They just watch for something to happen. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Something you may not see a difference for. Here, some time ago, I was at a meeting, and as a woman come through, she had ulcerated stomach, and it said, "Thus saith the Lord, you're healed." Another woman come through, had a big knot on her neck. Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. They went home believing that. Weeks passed. That woman tried to eat with that stomach trouble. She was so bad she couldn't. Stand nothing in her stomach, but still she held on. One morning, while the children had gone to school, she took some oats out of one of their plates and began to eat it. She was so hungry, a real strange feeling came to her. Never bothered her. She got some toast and buttered it, eat it. Then she fried two eggs and drank a cup of coffee. Never hurt her. It was gone. She was happy. She ran down the street to tell her sister that, that it had the big knot on her neck and it hadn't moved. They called them fanatics because they'd believed. And she said, when she got there, that woman is screaming, jumping up and down. She ran in. She said, you know, I'm healed of my stomach trouble. Said, I just got up a while ago. I've shuck every sheet. That knot's gone. I don't know what happened to it. See, what happened? God don't always come just in an instant. You remember when Daniel, the angel, told him he tried to get to him for 21 days? If the angel of the Lord, who is here, is the angel of God, it proves himself to be. And if I've asked the blessing with the sincerity of my heart upon you and with the same sincerity you've met it and there's no doubt in your mind at all, you just hold to that and watch what happens. It has to happen. It's got to. It's God's word. It's God's promise. He has to do it. Now, how many of you believe you're going to be well regardless of what? You're going to be well. You have to be. Now, here's a, a, a container of of handkerchiefs. And now let us pray for them. Lord, we are told in the sacred word that they've taken from the body of Paul handkerchiefs and aprons, and evil spirits went out. That was the same Paul who could look steadfast upon the man and tell him he perceived he had faith to be healed. The same Paul who was upon the ship that night, and the angel of the Lord stood by him and told him, Fear not, Paul. None's going to be lost. And he could run forth in the midst of the waves and sing. The storm just as hard as it ever was stormy. Maybe harder. But be of a good cheer, he said. For the angel of God, whose servant I am, stood by me last night and promised me deliverance. They seen that angel working through Paul. Lord, we're not St. Paul, but you're still Jesus. The same angels of God. The same Holy Spirit. And I lay my hands upon these handkerchiefs and ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, may every person that touches these handkerchiefs be made well. Grant it, Lord. And Father God, it was said one time that your children was coming from bondage, going into the promised land of good health, prosperity, and the Red Sea got in their way. God looked down to the pillar of fire and frowned upon that Red Sea because it was holding his people from the blessing. And the sea got scared and rolled back. And Israel went over to the Promised Land. O Lord, as you see these tokens of your word, which we most solemnly believe to be the truth, and as I press these to my heart, Lord, let the God of heaven not look through again as much a pillar of fire, but through the blood of his own Son, Jesus, that gave the promise of healing by his stripes we are healed. And when these handkerchiefs are placed upon the sick, may the devil turn them loose. And may they go to that promise that God's given. 
By his stripes we are healed. I send them to the sick and the afflicted in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I solemnly believe with all my heart that Christ will heal every person that wears those handkerchiefs. There's no doubt in my heart. I do not doubt. God said it so. Why could I stand here and challenge in Africa a half a million people, or India rather, in Africa thousands times thousands of witch doctors and all kinds of superstition? Come forth and prove your God. Don't you be afraid. Jesus is still Jesus. God's still God. There is not enough devils and torment can challenge His word. And not, nothing can withstand when unadulterated faith rests upon any promise God gives. It's the truth, and it'll stand through every fiery trial. Amen. You love Him? Amen. Let's sing once while they're still back there shouting and receiving the Holy Ghost. Let's raise our hands as we sing. I love Him. Will you give us the card, sister? So. Love Him. Let's stand now. I love him. God bless you, doctor. Don't pray for him. You want to dismiss the audience? See you tomorrow. Love. Lord bless you. Real good. Brother.